HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Bob's Red Mill believes in baking, breakfast, and the pursuit of good food for all. Learn more at bobsredmill.com slash podcast. Thank you for listening to Heritage Radio Network. We are a member-supported, nonprofit food radio station. That means that every single thing we do, from broadcasting 35 weekly shows for free to bringing you exclusive content from sold-out food events across the country to offering scholarships to high school students, is only possible thanks to the support of our loyal members. And we want you to join the club. Become a member during our 2017 Summer Drive to get access to sweet swag and pledge your support to the world's only food radio station. Visit heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to become a member now. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Farm Report coming to you from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn on Heritage Radio Network. Thank you so much for listening. Um, right right away, right at the top of the show, uh, I have to send out a, a short appeal on behalf of the network that the Farm Report calls home. We are in the midst of our annual summer funding drive and I'm hoping folks out there who listen can show their support for the show, can so show the appreciation for the voices we bring onto the airwaves through this program and the 30 plus weekly shows that happen here out of this tiny shipping container in the middle of a pizza restaurant by visiting the website www.heritageradionetwork.org. Click that bean heart at the top right and throw us a couple bucks. They get some good prizes there, prizes, gifts swag uh you can wear your t-shirt with pride um but you know any any amount helps any amount makes you a supporter so please consider uh throwing us a couple bucks all right that said i am very excited to be joined in the studio today by susan Strait sherman susan welcome to the studio hi erin thank you for having me so um Susan and I have known each other for quite some time, and I thought she would be the perfect person to bring in to talk a little bit more about something I've been mulling over the last couple of months. I've been really thinking about uh, our food system and food supply and with the rise of all these kind of uh, amazing food kits that you can get out there, the Blue Apron, the Purple Carrot, the R Harvest. I know you know them because they're popping up on your Instagram feed, your Facebook feed. If you're a New York City subway rider, you cannot avoid them. You've probably heard from your grandma or your auntie or your friend. And, um, you know, they all, many of them promise very similar things. And, and I spent a little bit of time last fall kind of cooking my way through the different kits and definitely some pluses and minuses there. But one of the things that I have been kind of mulling over was this idea of how we think about cooking. And I th- I think a lot of the food world has kind of coalesced around this idea that, you know, cooking is easy just by simple, great ingredients and, and things will magically happen. And 
I guess I've just been feeling more and more like that narrative is a bit of a disservice to people who are coming to cooking really for the first time. They didn't grow up in homes that cooked. They didn't have that kind of built-in infrastructure that maybe I had. I don't know, Susan, did you have that growing up? I did. I'm very fortunate. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I did. So I think that there's a real like value to just kind of that immersive experience you have as a kid, seeing your mom cook and being included in that space. But if you didn't have that I think the kitchen can feel super overwhelming and you get it. You're out there, you're buying local, you're at the farmer's market, picking up great stuff. And then you get home and you're like, ah, now what? And I, I, I also have been feeling like, gosh, is there like some type of gendered thing going on here where this idea that this is so easy is somehow this, you know, falling along this lineage of kind of devaluing what has traditionally been, Uh, women's work. And I know even myself as someone who has a long history in food and training as a professional chef and is only cooking for just myself, that the amount of kind of effort and brain power I put into like planning my meals for the week or the month or the day, it's not nothing. It's not easy. It's, It's fun. It's enjoyable. It relaxes me. It's all of those things. But I think there's a real solid skill set here. And so I noticed um, on on Susan's uh, Facebook feed uh, a new project that she had launched. Uh, It's an amazing blog. It's called Crate Cooking. You can find it, read it. You should do both of those things, cratecooking.com. But I was so intrigued by your approach to sharing a way to cook that felt super fresh and really salient to me. So what is crate cooking? So crate cooking is, um, it's a way that I've been cooking, I think for the last several years. And after I had a baby, I realized that I had less everything, less time, less space, (laughs) more baby, yeah, more baby, (laughs) more baby, definitely. Um, and I, I was thinking about the methods in which I was cooking as a society. We're not necessarily, the group that goes to the market and thinks, okay, this looks fresh. I'll buy this. I'll buy this. And then I'm going to make these wonderful things with it. A lot of us, what we do is we find a recipe. And then from that recipe, we go and we buy all of those things. And then we're left with excess in our refrigerators and our pantries. And we're not sure what to do. We could, we get a recipe that calls for six different types of herbs. And then you're using a little bit of each one of those herbs and then they go bad in your refrigerator. So what I wanted to do was to come up with, and I call this, um, my crate It's come up with some basic crate items for your pantry. And from using those, you build with seasonal items and you make a repertoire of really simple, but good, and not boring recipes. And through that, I wanted to show people that you don't need to do these huge elaborate recipes with tons of ingredients that through using simple items, you can really highlight the beauty of a dish and of an ingredient and, and make something great. So you, yeah, so I, I want to think about, um, some of the items that are like haunting my fridge right now. Okay. (laughs) Um, There is a pretty large piece of fresh horseradish that is dying a slow death. (laughs) There is, um, miso paste and this like Korean red chili paste and like, it's probably like eight jars of anchovies in varying states of mustards. Fullness. Mustards kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, you know, and then I think too about like my spice cabinet, and I have cardamom that I bought. I'm not exaggerating. Ten years ago, mm-hmm. uh, that I finally just threw out earlier this summer. But I think that there is this idea that to be like a a real cook or a good cook that when you open your um, pantry, when you open your spice cabinet, when you open your fridge, you have everything you need and you're completely stocked up. Um, but that's just like not super realistic. It also doesn't necessarily lead to better tasting food. Mm-hmm. It's like opening a closet that's completely full, but yet you feel like you have nothing to wear because there are almost too many choices, too much going on. And your mind sees it and it's it's so busy and the whole thing 
point is, is that you just really want to simplify things. You're like, I'm, I'm like, oh, also haunted by, I'm like, just thinking about stuff that's on top of my cupboard, <laughs> <laughs> like, like little bits of different, I got really into seaweed. There are like 18 different types of seaweed that I like don't know how to use. <laughs> um, so like the crate cooking sounds a little bit to me, like, uh, if I don't know if folks are familiar with like a capsule wardrobe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's exactly where, um, my influence came from. I was looking at capsule wardrobes on Pinterest thinking, well, now that I haven't gone back to my old job and I have a baby, I didn't want to buy a ton of new clothes. And the emphasis with capsule wardrobes is that you start with really classic, uh, basic items that you can wear forever and that you're not, you know, in terms using disposable clothing or constantly updating your wardrobe every season. So you stick with basic items and the same thing, I I wanted to parlay that in to um into cooking you stick with basic items and then you rotate in really simple seasonal things so for instance a basic item in crate cooking is olive oil kosher salt lemons using the zest and the juice um, a really great baguette mustard those sorts of things you use as a foundation and then since it's summer right now you can rotate in fresh raspberries nectarines summer squash zucchini tomatoes basil marjoram that sort of thing so you're not you're not working with a ton of things, but at the same time, it's not too repetitive or boring. I also feel like we pretend that we eat these like super diverse diets, but like most people I know kind of like eat more or less the same, like five or six meals yeah, yeah. over and over and over again for months or even years. Well, it's what you're comfortable with. I mean, not only in terms of eating, but with cooking too. I mean, once you get something, you want to you want to keep making it like that's your specialty. <laughs> so I want to tell you guys a little bit more about Susan's background because she's not coming to this um, from out of left field. Um, <laughs> you know, you uh, did your undergraduate at the University of Michigan. And Go then, blue. <laughs> I know, right? Fellow <laughs> alums. Um, and then you you moved to New York and you ended up pursuing a degree at the what was then the F- French Culinary Institute and now the International Culinary Center. Yes. Um, what prompted that decision? Oh, gosh, I don't even want to. Honestly, I was watching the Food Network, and I remember Jada De Laurentiis saying, after I went to UCLA, I went to Le Cordon Bleu, and I thought, huh, you can just go to culinary school. I don't it, it, That had never been prompted in my mind before. So I looked into it. I had um, several roommates that I was living with in Ann Arbor that were coming out to New York, and I thought, hey, if they can do this, why can't I? So that was that. I, I'd never been to New York city before when I sent in my application and I think paid my deposit. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and then I came a few months after graduation, got an apartment with friends and I started, um, at school a month later. So tell me about those first couple of weeks at school. What was it like? It was, it was a lot of fun. It was, I had a great experience there. So it's, um, the school, it still is the school's down in Soho at Broadway and Grand and just seeing the neighborhood for the first time, like little Italy, um, and down there, it was, it was so much fun. Um, just getting introduced to the techniques and the things that we were doing. And I was, I was still so new to the city when I came here. So it was a total overload, not only, in terms of food and culinary preparation, but also it was a huge universal change for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from a one traffic light town, so yes, we have that in common. So I like definitely can relate. Yeah, yeah. I thought Ann Arbor was a big town. Oh my gosh, Ann Arbor was the biggest city in the world when I moved there. <laughs> so you graduate from FCI. Mm-hmm. Um, you're looking for your first kind of job. What were you thinking? And what'd you end up doing? Um, I really wanted to get a tan, so I got a job. A tan? As, yes, a tan. Okay, I wanted to make sure I heard you right. <laughs> so I um, I was lucky enough to find a great family that lived in the Hamptons, and I was their live-in private chef, and it truly m- might be the most amazing job I've ever had in my life. It was so much fun. They were great people to work with. I'd wake up at 6.30 every morning, and I would drive to, I believe it was Wayne Scott, and go to the fish market every day, and then come back and go to the other markets uh, as the day went on, and it was it was awesome. I was cooking anywhere between four and sixteen people um, per meal, and it was it was so great to be out to be out on the ocean. Yeah, and I, I think also like having that kind of autonomy, working with super fresh ingredients. Why did you leave? Um, it was just a seasonal thing. Got it was it. a summer house, but I remember like I got tan. Yeah, <laughs> I got tan. I stayed there on my days off, and my friends were so confused because they just said what are you doing? Like they just let you into your house and, 
into their house and, and let you cook? Like, how do you know what to cook? And I, I would just sit up, I remember at night with Barefoot Contessa cookbooks and think like, okay, I have to make muffins tomorrow for the, the housekeepers and that sort of thing. But it was, it was such a great experience being out there and also being from Michigan, which you have the Great Lakes, but it's, it's pretty landlocked in terms of the ocean. But to get it, um, the experience with um, the seafood that was out there, I mean, I was cooking a lot of this stuff for the first time other than culinary school, scallops, that sort of thing. It, it was such a wonderful time. I feel like any kind of shellfish for a Midwest girl, it feels like an <laughs> alien creature. Yeah, it's like the shells go in the dish. What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, um, I think something's wrong here. Yeah. Uh. Are these dirty? <laughs> um, what did you get your undergraduate at uh, U of M in? Uh, English. In English. Yeah. Okay. So when you decided that you were going to go to FCI and then you graduate and you call mom and dad to say, I'm going to be a personal chef. How'd that conversation go? Well, um, we knew that it was going to be a temporary thing. Just I, I going into the job, I mm-hmm. knew that. Um, and then you know, come after Labor Day, I had to find a big girl job. And I really wanted to try my hand at food media. And in culinary school, they kind of give you the talk because I feel like the Food Network was so popular then. And they were kind of going through this stage where everyone was like, oh, I'm going to be I'm going to be a star and I'm going to do this. And, and breaking into the food media, it was a, it was it was different then because there wasn't there wasn't social media. So you had to find a really interesting way to kind of make your mark on the industry. Blogs were just starting out in 2007 and 2008. And I remember meeting with a career advisor and he was telling me, you know, you should consider blogging. And I was thinking, what, what is that? That sounds like such a silly thing to do. Like who would who would want to read what other people have to say? Right. It's like what is it just like your diary, but online? Yeah. no, it, it, it's changed so much since then. Um, so. So I started applying for more grown-up jobs after that, and I did a test kitchen internship at Good Housekeeping Magazine, which was amazing. Their test kitchen overlooks Central Park in the Hearst Building. And then from there, I was hired to be an assistant food editor for uh, Martha Stewart Living's Everyday Food Magazine. I feel it. So Martha is currently the cover girl of this, uh, this the newest Cherry Bomb. Mm-hmm, yes. Um, and so, and and one of the things that's interesting, kind of talking with uh, Carrie about working with Martha, she's like, you know, if you trace back, like Martha is like the food world's Kevin Bacon. Where there's like, especially in New York, you're always like one, two, three degrees away from everyone from Martha. So what was that like? I loved it. It. I remember walking down the halls every day and thinking, this is so cool that I work here. Um, I was in the test kitchen. So there are old offices on 42nd Street. We were there. Um, there was a team of six food editors. So I was the assistant. I was low man on the totem pole. And primarily what my job was to do was to cross test every single recipe the final time before it was published. Um, so, you know, you're dealing with the end, the end game of things, but you have to make sure that it was perfect. But it was great. I remember the first time that I saw Martha in the office. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> You're like sending pictures to mom. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. I mean, I don't even. Did I have a phone with a camera then? It was 2008. I don't think so. <laughs> that would have been really shady. But no, no. no but now, totally acceptable. Um, we had to make her lunches on Wednesdays, so it was it was a great job. No complaints. So tell me it. So recipe testing recipe development Mm -hmm. like like what's the difference like how does that how does that work I think most people who are new to cooking are you know you go and you like read a recipe and you're like well if it if someone's written a recipe then it just it it works and yet we all know that some are better than others and Mm -hmm. so can you kind of like lift the veil a touch on that like process Usually you start out with some sort of a creative meeting, whether it's ideas from an editor, like a main editor or within the department themselves. Like, so say we're working, you're working on an August issue. What, what sorts of things do you really want to highlight going on in August? Um, and then from there you can kind of pick what, what sort of recipes that you want to do. So then you get someone that develops it and you can make it a few times once you feel that it's a strong recipe. And then as a cross tester, what I would do is come in blindly, take somebody else's recipe and then make it, make it entirely from A to Z, make comments on, um, the ingredients, the methods, what works, what doesn't work. Does it taste good? I mean, that comes into consideration too. Um, any sort of, any and all feedback. Um, working in test kitchens and at Good Housekeeping too, we would finish recipes and then we would gather everyone together and do this thing called a tasting. 
and all the employees um, from the, you know, the director to the assistant, we would all talk, share our feedback, um, what sort of thing. So the more that the recipe is tested in general, you, you hope that it's more concrete, um, which is something that, you know, and I know a lot of bloggers deal with because when you're blogging, you're your own boss. You know, at what point is this recipe ready to go? Like, should I make it one more time just to just to make sure that, you know, it, it works? And I know a lot of people struggle with chef cookbooks because sometimes it can be hard to translate those massive quantities that you're making on the line than to a serves for recipe yeah. in a cookbook. Well, I think, too, I think when you're looking at uh, restaurants from 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 professional uh, chef's kitchen it's the number of ingredients that's like kind of also like the opposite of like a crate cooking model where you're like okay we'll start um one week in advance making the first version of the stock and then like i i remember working at gramercy we had this uh, lemon vinaigrette sounds super simple right delicious uh lemon dressing that we made every day um for dressing salads and then it would became a component in a lot of other dishes in the restaurant but that simple lemon vinaigrette was composed of eight different in- ingredients and like six of the eight of those required like somebody else to have made some type of puree or a seasoned oil and it was like Really, almost everyone in the kitchen somehow had like a hand <laughs> in the production in of the this one lemon <laughs> in, in this one vinaigrette, and then this vinaigrette was in a bunch of the stuff because it was one of the ways that the chef really liked to accent uh, like a softer lemon flavor. And I was, I was just like, man, this is just not not a thing that you can <laughs> replicate at home. It's or not with, realistic for the everyday cook. Not at all. Not at all. Um, so you left um, Martha and uh, the, 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 that position to go work for New York City's Green Markets yes. with uh, the famous June Russell. So. <laughs> I love June. <laughs> um, so you were working um, with her doing farm inspections. Mm-hmm. How did that transition happen? How do you go from uh, recipe testing and Mar- with Martha Stewart to like hitting the farms of uh, you know New York State and the surrounding areas. Well, I was freelancing while I was working for June. I was also doing some freelance stuff in the background too, some recipe editing for MarthaStewart.com for the Food Network, and I was also testing recipes at Real Simple Magazine. But working with the green markets, I, that was one of the greatest periods of my life too. I, I've been fortunate. I, people are fun when you work in food. Yeah. Um, but You're working, like, how many greatest periods do I get? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that too much. Um, is my daughter listening? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but with June, it was was so much fun. Um, I I did a lot with the the crop reports and you know the numbers that they're submitting to Green Market. I helped out with a lot of the administrative work um, in farm inspections. What's a crop report? So I don't know, crop report. I, more or less, they, they send you the information on, you know, what they're producing every year, how much they're producing, what they're growing, that sort of thing. So Green Market does keep tabs on that sort of thing. And I, I did a lot of administrative work. And then occasionally I'd, I'd get to go out in the fields with June, which was so much fun and to see her interact with people. And she's so smart and just all the fun stuff that she had going on with that. Yeah, I think that's like it's one of the things that makes the New York City green market so special is that they are a producer only market Mm -hmm. and that they do have a position with like multiple staff, you know, a department, essentially farm inspections Mm -hmm. with multiple staff people who are making sure that, you know, the produce you're buying at green market um, makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's something that is reasonably produced in that region Mm -hmm. if they have signs saying organic or, you know, sustainably raised or no spray that then they're actually uh, following up with that. June's making sure they're (laughs) legit out there. (laughs) Exactly. And I I think you can, it doesn't take much imagination to think about, you know, there's upwards of, I think, 50 plus markets during the prime season in New York. Um, So lots of lots of lots of moving parts to kind of keep track of that Mm -hmm. um so you were doing a lot of things i think that is like another thing i want to just like highlight is that when people are working in food you're often kind of putting your hands in a lot of different spaces um and 
uh, what was that like? Like, how do you like juggle the kind of like freelance part time landscape? Like, what were you? What like what was your diet like at that time? What were you kind of eating? How did how did your cooking look? It was it was exhausting, but it was fun too. When you're in a test kitchen, you know, you try to take the leftovers as well. So sometimes you've got stuff that you normally wouldn't you wouldn't have around. <laughs> but like I had like eight blueberry muffins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or I one time real simple. We did uh, we did a story I remember on flank steak, like ten different ways with flank steak. We had so much steak after that, which you know, it, it's cool. Like for the first first few hours and then, yeah and then you're like go away uh but working at the green markets I was it was so wonderful the farmers are usually pretty generous to the employees that were out there and you know try this they're excited to get the feedback from these people that are working with them on a daily basis it I mean it was great um I made relationships with a lot of wonderful people especially I feel like with the the protein, the protein farmers, Mm -hmm. uh, flying pigs. I remember being so excited and getting to try their stuff. The fishing companies that are coming in blue moon, especially they're awesome. Uh, I was eating pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) That's like kind of the, I feel like that's the thing I always talk about when I was cooking. I was like kind of the worst dietary time of my life. I'm like, what can I eat out of a quart container over a garbage can in four minutes? That's calorie dense enough to get me through service, but doesn't require a lot of chewing. Yeah. It can be different from day to day. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) A lot of apple cider donuts sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) The glamour, right? Exactly. Um, Okay. So from there you started working for a you know a competitive culinary school <laughs> from your alma mater yes yes so how, so how did that job come about I burnt out from the freelancing industry yeah. my husband was freelancing at the time too um, in film and television so it was it was a lot and I was kind of looking for something a little bit more nine to five so I went to ice which was wonderful so I was the program manager of the school of recreational cooking which is separate from their professional school so these are for, these classes were for people that were coming in and, you know, wanted to take maybe a class on how to make cupcakes or demystifying fish. And at the time, I believe we were doing 2,500 classes annually. Wow. Yeah. So um, it's been referred to as the largest recreational cooking school in the U.S. So can you talk a little bit, like, how is a cooking class for recreational cooks different from the cooking classes you took as like a professional student? The unfortunate thing is that it's, it's not nearly enough to, to really get a great repertoire for beginning cooks. You have to really, really stick with it. Um, so there are, there are differences in that just because experience is, is what's going to make you a good and confident cook, which is, which is really important to the, the confidence in the kitchen and seeing ingredients and that sort of thing and knowing that, that you can do this. Um, so that, that's probably the biggest difference, obviously, but the, a lot of it was the same, the same instructors, which was great. You know, we'd have our instructors that were teaching the professional classes. And then on Saturday nights, they would teach recreational students that couples that were out on a, on a date that wanted to learn how to cook steaks and, and sides with that. Um, but the techniques that they're teaching are the same. It's, there's a lot of this. We we would we would pull from a lot of the same um, criteria, but it's just it's the the, the, the continuous like repetition. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like you're, people always ask like, "Oh, can you teach me how to be good at knife skills?" I'm like, "Sure." get a 50 pound bag of onions and let's slice them. Yeah. Like that's like literally the only way. Mm-hmm. Like I can t- teach you a class, but if you want to be good at it, you just have to do. And I think that's like one of the benefits of like working in a professional environment is you just get to do it so many more yeah. times. But the thing about cooking is, uh, I, you know, it's for a, a lifetime, right? Mm-hmm. So I think too, you always uh, have to eat. Exactly. Well, I think like one of the things I feel like happens to a lot of people I know is they, they have the desire to cook. They have allocated a reasonable amount of time. They have the financial resources to buy great ingredients. And so they get, you know, they, they, co- they go over all these hurdles and they get into the kitchen um, and they get stuck in that space of like not feeling like they know what to do mm-hmm. or how to do things. And like they want to be able to have the flexibility to step away from rest- recipes um, but like you said, the confidence factor is is big. And I think if you think about any kind of skill set in your life that you're trying to develop, it's like you do need to invest that time just practicing. Um, 
And so I want to talk a little bit more uh, about opportunities for practice, but we are going to take just a short uh, station break. You, of course, are listening to the Farm Report. I'm in the studio with Susan Streit Sherman of CrateCooking.com. Hang tight. We are going to be right back. I'm Mike Calameco, host of Food Talk on Heritage Radio Network, and I'm here with Bob Moore, founder of Bob's Red Mill, as well as Ray and Tom Williams, who've worked with Bob for years and co-own an organic farm in eastern Oregon and Washington. Ray, Tom, why is organic farming so important to your family? It's all a matter of the soil as a source of nutrients. You increase organic matter of the soil, you increase the water holding capacity. Water is becoming increasingly scarce. So in terms of sustainability, we don't think it's the only answer, but it's one answer, and it's the answer that we're trying to pursue. It's been a challenge, and it's been fun, because it it is different, and we're learning how to do it for the last 10-plus years. We're not just doing organic. We're doing organic to high standards. Bob, why did you choose to partner with Ray and Tom? Oh, goodness. Well, because they're the best farmers in Oregon, and they're close, and they have a bunch of acres, I think about 10,000, over in in eastern Oregon and Washington. They're wonderful farmers, and their family have been farmers over there uh, for many, many years. It's really important that you have long-term relationships, and we've enjoyed a long-term relationship with Bob's because there are a lot of challenges to organic farming. You simply don't have as many tools as a conventional farmer, and so you have to rely on longer-term solutions. Knowing that you have a market is absolutely critical. The margins in farming are not that great, so if you grow the stuff and you can't sell it, you have a real problem. And we know with Bob's that we have a market, and uh, we turn out high-quality grains, and they buy them, and it all works well. Learn more about Bob's Red Mill and their commitment to good food for all at bobsredmill.com slash podcast. And I can't get enough of it. It's summertime and the feeling is right. And I can't get enough of it. All right, we are back and we are uh, super excited because we've just been joined in the studio by a very spe- special, if tiny, guest. Uh, do you want to introduce Yay! her, Susan? Hi, Leah. This is my daughter, Leah. She's 11 <laughs> months old. <laughs> we figured, uh, you know, wouldn't be a complete episode without a little bit of fun background noise. 11 months. Well, congratulations. Thank you. You are, like, under the year mark. Um, August 9th. I, I want to hear a little bit about, like, how... Um, how your kind of culinary cooking life... Uh, change through pregnancy and then like into being a new mom assuming it has it was well pregnancy uh, that was that was pretty rough for me the first 20 weeks everything I was eating was white okay (laughs) Uh, mashed potatoes pizza so those first 20 weeks I wasn't doing much cooking at all and then after the second set of 20 weeks, I was really trying to put more green things into my diet. I, my obstet- my midwife, in fact, she she was really stressing, you need to be eating greens, you need to be eating greens. And that definitely didn't happen in the, the beginning of pregnancy. It was never going to happen. I don't understand how anyone could so enjoy just, that. So just because, like, you just weren't craving them, like, you were a green eater before, and then, like, I felt changed. so sick. Yeah. and. I, anything that was white for some reason was the only thing that seemed appealing to me. Got Ice it. cream, nothing, nothing acidic, nothing healthy seemed interesting at all. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't keep it down. It was, it was pretty rough. Oh man, that must have been kind of disorienting. It was. Did you like, did you, did you like where you were shopping change? You're like, where do I even go for such things? <laughs> and I actually, I wasn't doing that much shopping. I was ordering so, so much, much food. food. I was so sick. I'm, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah. Um, but after I had Leia, it really took me a while to find my groove. You could say my groove back in the kitchen because I needed things to be quick and I needed it to be more than just pasta. Right. More than just, 
I guess you could say a, a one pot dish. So that was another way, a, a reason that, that crate cooking kind of came about is because I wanted it to not just be one little thing, you know, to be a full round meal, but um, to really to be quick, because especially when she when she was about three months, I only had so much time before she wanted to be held again or before she would freak out. And then, of course, there's that whole nap factor that, yeah, that you had to squeeze in. So that's where the recipes that I began to develop came in um, using using my oven a lot because that's unattended cooking putting several things in the oven at once, not having four different pots going on the stove. That's a nightmare. Things that don't require a ton of preparation, things that are quick, but yet great. Can you give me an example of like what, what you mean when you're like things that don't require a lot of prep or things that are quick? Like, I mean, I love the, I love the using the oven cause it's more like passive cooking time mm-hmm. versus the stove top where you have to kind of keep an eye on things. But uh, just for folks who are out there, it's like, what is she talking about? Help me. (laughs) Sure, sure. So one of the recipes that I did was um, a mustard vinaigrette chicken. You you make a basic vinaigrette, so mustard, olive oil, lemon, salt, pepper, and tarragon, and then you marinate chicken in that. So the chicken sits in the bag with the marinade. That's that's the biggest part of cooking the chicken is it marinades and it marinades in the refrigerator. You don't have to do anything else. And then with that, I roast it on a bed of spring onions. So the onions in the chicken that's already marinated, those go in the oven and the oven does all of the work. Then you pull it out when it's cooked and you have chicken and you have a vegetable side right there that you can eat. So that's an example of your oven being unattended cooking. Right. And not requiring a lot of preparation. I wasn't, cutting those onions and making a bechamel sauce to serve with them and then putting breadcrumbs on top and rebaking that. They just go underneath the chicken. They get the flavorings from the chicken and also the vinaigrette quick and easy. So you're like looking for opportunities to kind of create flavor and Mm -hmm. reduce kind of knife cutting. What about cleanup? Cleanup can be tough. (laughs) It's my least favorite part. (laughs) When I'm recipe testing, cleanup, cleanup is a lot. I don't have a dishwasher. I'm in a 450 square foot apartment. So it's a tiny little studio, a kitchen, and I am the dishwasher. But cleanup, cleanup can be hard. I try not to use too many dishes. That's another preparing food. A lot of preparation in a restaurant kitchen, as you know, is a huge way to make a mess in your kitchen. I mean, you can use a little bowl for everything and you can spend hours preparing things. So I've found that the less preparation that I have to do, that's another way to cut out dishes, countertop cleaning, stove cleaning, and your oven. You don't have to clean it after every use. (laughs) Right. So I also like, I don't, so I don't need to like keep everything in tiny little precious bowls to be really cooking. It might take a pretty picture, but it is not practical at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think that, you know, folks uh, who are starting to engage in uh, building out their kind of culinary skill set, which I was talking about a little bit before the show, you want to think about as a long-term investment, mm-hmm. right? So um, trying to focus on uh, a, a, a collection of recipes or techniques at a time, um, and getting to know really well so a handful of ingredients, thinking about like this as a lifelong process that you're going to be skill building in a certain direction. Um, breaking that down, I think people have a pretty good sense of, you know, the idea of preparing a meal for an evening for their family. What I think is a little bit hard um, and a little bit more logistically challenging is when you're thinking about how do I um, cook for the week or how do I cook for the time frame that makes sense for my family mm-hmm. um, where you might have a certain type of schedule Monday through Friday and a very different schedule Saturday and Sunday um, here in the city, you know, going out to eat as part of it. So like thinking about like, how do you start getting organized around um, how frequently to shop and like There's this whole, there's a, a, like, I think a lot of popularity around this idea of like doing meal prep where you're doing certain things for the whole week. Like, I'm just wondering like how you respond to thinking about the, like a week's worth of food or 10 days or four days or whatever that number might be kind of for you. I'm assuming it's not one day. Mm -hmm. Well, starting, I, I personally think that starting with fewer ingredients makes it easier on your brain in terms of planning. And once you learn the, the fundamentals, the things that you can do with 
just little things like salt and pepper and lemon juice and olive oil, once you learn that there are a lot of things that you can do with that, you'll realize that sometimes you don't even need to follow a recipe or you're talking about the lemon vinaigrette. If you have a simple vinaigrette at home, it's versatile. There are a lot of things that you can do with a, a, a lemon vinaigrette that has some herbs in it. You can use it as a marinade for chicken. You can use it as a dressing for greens. You can use it to dress potatoes for potato salad. Um, so for me, I think that it's about starting with less and just really, really learning to use what you have a, an herb like basil or thyme. Even they're very versatile. You don't need to use sage in this or rosemary in that, you know, you can just find that a little bit of one herb can really, can really make something nice and vegetables, especially the less that you do with them. I think the, the better that they are. And what I what I hope and what I hope people take away from the site is that they will see you don't need to do a lot. And from this, you can say, all right, well, I know that I have corn and I have zucchini in my fridge and I really don't need to do much other than saute the two of them and add some butter, some salt and a little bit of basil. And that's all that it needs. So that's what I hope people can take away from crate cooking is they'll get a good collection of items in their kitchen and see that they don't have to do much and that they can create a lot from that. I think also from someone who has a long pedigree of professional culinary recipe writing, recipe testing, um, and, and I think it's like neat because you bring such a unique perspective to to that work of like, hey, I want it to be simple. I want it to be easy. But I think there's also what I'm hearing in here a little bit, too, is an element of like rule breaking where you're like, hey, it might call for tarragon, but you can just use basil. Yes. And it will be delicious. Yes. And I've gotten some of those comments on my recipes before. I don't like tarragon. What else can I use instead? Well, use basil. Don't put the tarragon in. It's going to be fine. And another thing that drives me nuts is when you don't have a certain ingredient. And a lot of those times with, with my recipes, I really wanted to focus on was that if you don't have something, you don't need to be running out the last minute to get it, make it work without it. You don't have lemon juice for a dressing, use a little white wine vinegar. It's not going to be the end of the world. It doesn't have to be exactly like that. So rule breaking is a really great, a really great way of putting it too. Right. make it easy on yourself. Yeah, right. I think I I have been like really focused on that sentiment exactly just in my life general. I'm like, hey, what would be an easier way to do this? Mm -hmm. Because I find I personally kind of I'm like, oh, how can I make this like bigger and more complicated and perfect (laughs) and perfect? And I'm like, hey, how about just being happy with like something that's like 75 percent you want it to be? And it's going to be like a delicious meal and it will be fine. I love uh, I feel like Julia Child is such a role model to me in this space. She has so many great kind of. Um, like one-off quotes of like, you know, you're always alone in the kitchen. Right? I think it's just like her famous line. She's like dropping a chicken on the floor. Um, and then another thing, another like piece of advice from her is like, you know, if people don't know your menu and you're in the kitchen and something goes wrong and you need to make a last minute adaptation, that's fine. Like yes. you like ultimately you've like got a bunch of delicious things together and just because it was supposed to be one way and now it's another, like I can remember own it, be intentional. Yes. I, I went to a barbecue last year and I, and I was excited cause I wanted to bring, um, summer rolls and I, you know, made this like delicious kind of, uh, raw vegetable filling and like soaked the rice paper and made all these beautiful rolls and put them all into a plastic bag and put them in the basket of my bike and drove over to my friend's house. And I was like, I made summer rolls and I pulled them out of my bag and I was like, I mean, summer mush. <laughs> Cause <laughs> I didn't know I had like over soaked the rice paper and then, you know, they're not supposed to be touching. So they all just disintegrated. And I like took a look at it for a minute and asked her for a cutting board and chopped it up and tossed it in with some lettuce and made like a, you know, a torn rice sheet. Mm-hmm. Your Vietnamese vegetable summer salad. Salad. <laughs> and people loved it and it was delicious. Yeah, just it's exactly how you wanted it. <laughs> this is the way it's supposed to this be. This is the way. It's a recipe I'm testing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's great. So um, we're just about out of time, but what is, uh, what's next for Crate Cooking? What are your kind of hopes and dreams? What do you want to... Um, ask of our listeners out there or, uh, you know, point them towards, uh, I'm looking forward to the holidays coming up. I, something that I've been working on for a while is to do a holiday crate. I'll call it a crate. 
right now I've got a summer one out and I started the blog with the spring, but I'm looking forward to the holidays of showing people just the few things that you need on hand to be able to whip up a great meal. One of my favorite things to make in the whole wide world is stuffing. I could make stuffing every single day. I have so much, so much fun making that. So I'd really like to help people um, gain a little wisdom through that during Thanksgiving and Christmas, I've done the hotline for food 52 for people that are having turkey problems. And I know that a lot of people find the the holidays and entertaining really daunting. So I'm excited to get that out for people and maybe help a few along the way. Oh man. So you're the voice if I call the, the, <laughs> I'm like the butterball line. The butter. <laughs> awesome. Well, Susan, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And this was great. Thanks to uh, Leah out there in the green room, <laughs> holding it down. She is. Yeah. Thank you to Bob's burgers for their <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> entertainment support during the making of this episode. Yeah. Um, of, and of course, obviously, while we're speaking of Bob's, uh, Bob's Red Mill, uh, longtime sponsor of the network. I'm like staring at a picture of Bob right now. Oh, uh, definitely appreciate their support. Uh, thank you so much for for checking out another episode of the Farm Report. Again, Susan's website is CrateCooking.com. Check it out. Uh, write her a note. Let her know you heard her on the Farm Report. Um, also, if you while you're while you're note writing, uh, you know, think about subscribing to the program via iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, leave a review; it really helps folks find the show and helps us know what you'd like more of. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.